Our, our first, I'd like to introduce John Kirkman. John Kirkman is Managing Director at um, Enterprise Transformation Partners in Perth, Australia. So John is probably the person who traveled farthest to get to Orlando, so appreciate him coming um, and participating in this session. Thank you, John. Second is Julie Smith, who is the leader of the Automation and Process Control Center of Competency at DuPont, and uh, is, I would say, one of the always the very wise and sensible voices that we look to in terms of an automation leader in the process industries for a company. Come on up, Julie, which has a, an operating uh, philosophy and record that that is, I would say, unsurpassed, pretty much. Um, third and last and not least is Steve Bittar, who is an R&D program manager for ExxonMobil and is one of the fellows that started the, the open process automation initiative uh, within ExxonMobil, even before uh, they were, they had def decided anything and started to look at at the the kind of issues that they had. Um, I think maybe um, one point I'd like to make is is the the reason, one important reason to have this kind of discussion and perspective on MTP in in a, in the context of open process automation is that the open process automation forum and the open group is working in a, in, a, in a collaborative understanding with Namur so that these two areas will eventually will remain compatible over time. So what I would say now is let's um, um, maybe what I would like to do is, is, is hold the questions if that's okay Mark for, for a moment and just kind of let our panel introduce themselves in terms of um, what their role in their company is, maybe go into that a little bit, and their role in the open process automation forum, and specifically you know, where you have contributed to the work and what you're going to be doing going forward. And uh, maybe explain some of your activities and why you're willing to, why your company is willing to invest in that, and maybe I'll start with with John because um, um, we know a little bit about about your company in terms of this area. So I'll, I'll let you wait for a while. So, so uh, John, why don't you start? Uh, thanks, Harry. Uh, can everyone? That's that's better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to to be on the panel. Uh, at Enterprise Transformation Partners, we're a small niche consultancy um, system integrator um, looking at level three and level two systems uh, and sp specifically in the mining industry. Um, so we've been around for about two and a half years. Um, why are we interested in interoperability and why do we invest time into it? Um, well, previously, uh, my business partner and I had worked at uh, BHP, a large mining company, and uh, that's where we got our first exposure to interoperability. And we did all the studies um, and about what the type of operating paradigm we could get to uh, on the back of, um, of an interoperable architecture. Uh, and the, the business opportunity and the value is quite significant in terms of unit, um, unit prices and throughput, um, production costs. So uh, once you sort of understood the value there, then it was more about how do we get to that point. So we've worked a lot of time um, with ISA on the ISA 95 and the level three standards over the years. Uh, we're always looking to, you know, close that gap between level two and level three uh, and doing my due diligence and looking around the various uh, opportunities out there to pursue that goal. Uh, we came across the Open Process Automation Forum uh, and then what we really liked about it was um, the governance structure uh, and also the, um, uh, the test conformance component to make sure that the technology actually emerged onto the, um, into the market. Um, so it was a very um, easy decision to sort of get involved in the in the work. Okay, thank you, Julie. Can you tell us about how you've been engaged in the uh, Open Process Automation Forum and sure. kind of your your background there? Okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, Julie Smith. I'm with the new Dupont, um, soon to be a separate company in a few short months here. Um, so we're currently the specialty products um, division. So. 
We've really changed a lot in the almost 29 years that I've been with the DuPont Company. We're now you know, making a lot more, as our name says, specialty products, um, tend to be batch-based, um, high value in use, um, you know, smaller lots. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there. We do a lot of active mergers and acquisitions as well. So that it has resulted in us having uh, quite a, a wide variety of control systems out in our plants. And I, I just see how much we struggle with how to share between those systems. You know, if, if someone on my team comes up with a really great way to control the fermentation process in one um, particular site, well, oh, they can't just use it on the other site because they've got system A and not system B. So we've got to completely re-engineer the application. And that's, that's pretty time consuming. So getting to the point where we have application portability, I think is a key um, initiative on, on the open process automation forum. That's one of the reasons that I joined. Okay. And Steve, what you know, uh, you've you've been at this a little longer than than most folks. Um, can you can you give people a little background on on where you have contributed so far? Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Harry. Uh, I'll condense the last seven years into just hopefully a minute <laughs> or so, uh, so as not to bore you too much. So um, <clears throat> back in maybe the end of 2011, I was coming back from Europe on an assignment, running a small engineering office, wanting to do something completely different. Um, and I learned about this program that Don Bartusiak was running. It was basically centered around how do we lower the cost of migration from an old DCS to a new one? And also, if we're going to replace and spend all this money on replacing the old system, how can we put in one that will allow us to generate some competitive advantage? Um, I thought that sounded like a pretty cool idea. So Dom was moving on. I took over the program about the end of 2011, beginning in 2012. There were a lot of threads uh, to the program initially. Um, you know, worrying about how to cut over low cost. But the one, the one real question that just stuck out in our minds that we really didn't know how to solve was how do we ensure there's a method for, or a uh, methodology for generating competitive advantage. So in 2013-14, we got a small skunk work team together inside ExxonMobil and got some consultants outside and we put together some functional characteristics, which were really a framework put together by Don. Uh, we hired Lockheed Martin in 20. 15, I think, to do some studies for us and also to build a prototype system, a proof of concept system. And, uh, and then in 2016, we all collectively kicked off the OPA forum. I think it was around November or so uh, with the open group. Um, and all this really, the, the OPA program is really driven off this really simple question asked by the senior executive management at ExxonMobil, which is, I'm going to spend this much money. How can I put in a system that allows me to generate more value and to, uh, you know, to lower my costs. So last year, I handed the program over to Brad Halk, who's, uh, <coughs> who's here this week as well. He's now the new OPA program manager, and I'm just serving in an advisory capacity now. Okay. But what about the uh, Open Process Automation Forum? Are you, what's your, are, do you have a formal role in that? I, I don't have a formal role. I was the uh, original uh, technical working group uh, co-chair okay. uh, in the program, but I've uh, since moved on out of okay. that. No, I, I would like to ask a couple a couple of questions. Just uh, maybe starting with Michael, if you don't mind. I uh, I um, one of the interesting things that that I pulled out of your presentation, Michael, is kind of the difference between what MTP is meant to solve and what some of the uh, open process automation areas. And you mentioned specifically that in the case of uh, modularization, if someone is delivering uh, automation module with equipment or something like that, it, the, it doesn't solve the problem necessarily of the user having fragmented um, applications that, that Julie mentioned as well. Um, how do, how do, how do the, as you're with an end user firm, uh, uh, how do you feel about that and, and uh, are, what, what kind of led to that decision? I understand the, the distinction, but I just wonder uh, how the, the um, as the end users in Namur feel about that, it would be a little bit surprising for me to see an end user organization go that way. I would say it was simply born out of uh, different business needs. And um, I think at least uh, to my knowledge, um, so that we have worked much longer on the, the MTP stuff. So before also we joined the open group. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that at the time being, so the problem... Um, was solved in a concept uh, of this MTP and, and maybe it was not seen possible 
to revolutionize at the same time the whole PLC programming, so which goes much deeper and uh, needs much more effort, so which we now see going on with the open group. Um, so, but in the end, so is now that this is being done, so this can uh, also benefit uh, vice versa from each other. It's interesting from my perspective, I, you know, the, the little work that I've done in the automotive industry, a lot of folks who or say robotics and other areas like that, who try to address all the different automotive manufacturers have very little control over what technologies they're going to use in their, in their applications, and it's a challenge for them. Um, and so I'm interested to see that as, as part of the, uh, uh, the Namur uh, work. Um, I, one other question I have on, on kind of MTP, and that would be the uh, idea of bundling automation in, in modular plants and very in, in many cases very small modular plants. You know, what is what is uh, the folks at BASF generally think about this and in, in your industry, especially maybe in the more in the fine chemicals area? Um, are they are they seriously thinking that this this is a good way to scale up in in terms of uh, particular products, or what what is it kind of their plans for this in the long run? So, so you're referring more than to the to the production strategies, and in the end, so there I would say so like it's more than 1,100 plants, so um, satisfying different customer needs. Um, so I would probably find a representative for each position there, uh, be it the numbering up instead of scale up. Uh, but of course, a lot of our more traditional, um, also petrochemical based productions uh, will use the scale effects uh, for the efficiency of the production. But mm -hmm. if you have to be quick in a certain market to build up a plant, so we are also confronted with these challenges that you want to satisfy a demand within one year, one and a half, um, then you would probably want to rely on these technologies to simply see who can supply you with suitable packaged units. And then suddenly automation is on the critical path because uh, all the process people are ready uh, it might be that it's already the pipe, the system, and then if you then start to integrate tech by tech, you might uh, become a showstopper. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that, that is one of the scenarios so, uh, where an, an, an pre-thought automation in terms of an MTP then comes into play. Okay. Now I'd like to transition maybe to more of the business-oriented questions. Uh, that, that, are, that are maybe broader than uh, just MTP, but in terms of the business changes, we talked about that this morning in the general session about the need to imagine and, and concentrate on those business aspects. And so what I wonder about is the OPAF, o OPAF has, said, has defined some roles of system integrator and uh, subsystem supplier and, and component supplier and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, how do, you, your firms probably, especially the end users, don't have those kind of roles now that you're probably, pre pre are you purchasing with a traditional model? So, you know, what kind of, what kind of procurement processes do you have now are, uh, that are, are there anything that you have that's oriented like that? Um, and what do you see in the future for this role of the system integrator for, for these open systems? And, and uh, John, you're welcome to talk about this too. It's a, kind of a viewpoint, but I'm interested in the end users in terms of how they see their procurement and, and those kind of processes changing. So maybe let, you want, you, who wants to start? Steve, sure, go yeah, ahead. No, sure, I'll start. No, it's, a great, it's a great question. So, um, I guess the first thing to say is that DCS suppliers in our minds are systems integrators. They're systems integrators today. They integrate components from multiple sources. They're not all their own. They find ways to make them work they're so that, such that they're coherent and they're stable and they're reliable and they're deterministic and they perform well. O OPA isn't asking for that much of a stretch other than we don't want one fixed single solution that's fit for all. Right? We want to be able to design systems that are fit for purpose. 
So that might mean that for this particular application, I don't have to spend this much money on this particular component, or maybe this one I want to spend a lot more money on this. So we want that flexibility to design a fit-for-purpose system. That means that the system integrators today that produce a one-size-fits-for-all have to be able to have the flexibility to build a multiplicity of different configurations for a wide range of users. Um, there is no reason to put a control system on a that's built for a nuclear power plant on a pilot plant that's relatively low risk. And there's no reason to spend that kind of money either, or, you know, nuclear power plant to wastewater treatment. Um, so it's gonna be a huge transformation for suppliers, probably more so than any of the other folks that you mentioned. Um, to make that cultural tra transition, it could be in maybe the most extreme case that a DCS supplier may be responsible for listening to a user and integrating, designing, testing, and building and supporting a system in theory that is comprised of not a single component that came out of their shop. And that's, that's a pretty dramatic change. Uh, on the other hand, even during the program or the project itself, they may be a prime contractor for a customer they may have other, other systems integrators reporting to them as subsystem integrators. It may be flipped. They may be a subsystem integrator reporting into another system integrator on another project. And they have to get used and comfortable to this different commercial relationship they're going to have in a, what is today a, an extremely competitive environment. Um, I think maybe, and the, the, the other flip side, um, just, just another 30 seconds to maybe mention about users. Um, you know, users have to change the way they think as well. Uh, right now, you, you, you pick from a multiplicity of one-size-fits-all control systems, and you apply it to solve your problem. But I think users are going to have to step back and think about this a little bit differently in the context of what are my requirements for this particular process application, or maybe this class of process applications, and being able to articulate and define those requirements, share them with your selected systems integrator, and then having them go ahead and uh, design, build, test. And maybe there's something off the shelf that already meets your needs. You would think after time that will probably happen. Uh, maybe there's a minor variation. I want this HMI instead of this HMI. And maybe the second thing that users are going to have to start doing is thinking about when I have these extra compute resources and capabilities at my disposal, because it's one of the objectives of OPA is to provide those capabilities, do I have the resources and capabilities to exploit them uh, to add to my bottom line. Okay. Turning to Julie, uh, you know, Julie, you have experience with three companies in, in a way. Um, can you talk about, you know, how your firms or the, the firms that you engage with now as part of the merger, demerger, um, how, do, how do those firms uh, classify these kinds of suppliers and there's a role for system integrators and how do you do that now and what do you see in the future for, for you, your firms? Right. So, for DuPont, I, a lot is not going to change, right? We are currently a very decentralized company. Um, we're going to be composed of five um, different businesses, each of which has a fair amount of autonomy. Uh, so they decide, you know, what, what they're going to do and what they need to run their business. It's, um, it's not us in headquarters telling them what to do. So that part's not going to change. Um, a couple things, though, will, will be different. Um, you know, as, as Steve mentioned, it's going to be, I think, a lot easier as we go to migrate systems because we won't have this big front end of, gosh, what should we do? What should we migrate to? Because it's going to be less important. It's, they're going to start to come together in, through interchangeability, and that's a really big deal. And we've got some um, sites right now looking at migration, and they're going through a pretty detailed process of putting together their requirements, sending out RFIs, evaluating responses, narrowing it down, going to visit, doing some test problems. That's, it's quite an involved effort. If we were to get to the point where you didn't need to do that anymore, you know, if, if, if I buy a system from vendor A and, oh, Vendor B has, you know, a, a component that I need. I, great, it'll slide in the same rack and I can use it. That's game changing. You can't, we don't have anything near that today. That's really what I think we'd like to get to. Okay. John, you're, you, you've uh, kind of been in the integrator role maybe more. Um, <clears throat> how does that, how does that, how do you see that and how does it work from, from the integrator role perspective in, in working with, major companies, international companies like BHP. Yep. Um, I think one of the things probably, you know, echoes Steve's comments, but um, 
one thing, probably another angle to look at is we're sort of collapsing the level three, the more traditional IT and the OT all together. Uh, but right now, my experience is that system integrators for OT are completely different companies most of the time than the ones for IT. Um, so I see the big opportunity and, and you know, work um, to be done is sort of organisations that can provide the architecture and component selection across uh, the level, traditional level two and level three sort of uh, systems to deliver on those requirements and ultimately the outcome of, you know, best in pre components to deliver more value as part of the solution. So with that comes uh, a whole lot of learning about those, uh, those joint requirements and joint architecture, which are traditionally separated. Uh, and then upskilling your team to be able to, um, you know, deliver those capabilities. And, um, and as such, there's a lot more opportunity, I think, but there's a lot of learning and, and uh, that goes into that process. There is, do you, you, do you, do you, uh, you, you think people are in, in, in your area of the world are, are ready to dive into that, some of the integrators? Uh, What's their willingness to, to go into those, in, into an area where that's yeah. so different in, in terms of moving up and down the, the manufacturing stack? Yeah, well, in my, in my region in uh, Perth, Western Australia and in the mining industry, they're only just becoming aware of sort of opportunities and familiarize themselves with, um, with things like OPAF and those sort of things. So I don't think at this stage they've really uh, had the time to get comfortable and understand what's going on to sort of have strong strategies moving forward. Um, but as part of that, we're running a project, as, as you know, Harry, in, in Australia to try and bring the mining community together and some universities. So not only can we contribute to the OPAF standards, but we can take the outputs and um, have some trial and test labs there. So they can get familiar not only with the technology, but the approach to architecting and all those things that are barriers to actually being able to, able to implement uh, this modular interoperable technology when it emerges. So I think if we start that process now and do that in parallel to uh, the standards work, uh, then we'll be able to set up the whole ecosystem um, you know, as soon as possible so we can realise the benefits of this work, which is really why we're all doing it. Okay. Um, any other comments on that point? Go ahead, Michael. So I, I see the business proposition so of the, the OPAF uh, both in the invest cost, so simply um, that components should be more competitive if you are able to strip out things which do not contribute to distinguish vendors from each other simply by setting free those resources uh, in, in the development. And then also in the life cycle because of changeability, etc., then of transferability of solutions. Um, but actually, so when it comes to project execution, so uh, we work together with system integrators already a lot, so for new projects, for replacement projects, and we already see is the pros and cons of this. So the pro is certainly the independence, uh, but those then also contract with one automation supplier of their solutions. I would not necessarily see that, be it an integrator without own products, or be it an automation supplier, would have then a complete mix uh, from different vendors when it comes to critical components. Because so everyone who operates uh, also has experienced then the situation if it does not run well, and then you need to trace down so where the issue comes from, so then suddenly you might be involved with the development of the product, and then you cannot be involved with the development of three different uh, parties then in the end. So in those projects, I would not, not really expect too much to change that you have one Mac responsibility, be it a system integrator, be it the automation supplier, and that from the portfolio where a vendor feels comfortable with, you probably have most components then from the same shop in the end, then maybe peripherals, uh, hardware components, IT components, of course, as it's today from different parties. But there I would not really see the, the disruption as hard. Okay, now let, me, let me turn to uh, the question of long-term system support. And I'd like to know from the end users kind of what your general uh, uh, automation su system support processes are like inside your firm and how those compare with how you support IT. And, and if you wouldn't mind ask, answering also, I'll keep, let you keep it in mind, what, what you see as major kind of pain points regarding support right now. Um, and uh, so any, anybody's welcome to dive in on that, but I think changing the support model, what, you know, we'd like to know where you are now, 
um, how that compares with IT and maybe what, what you might see evolving and, and what are your kind of pain points there? Does anybody want to jump in with that? Yeah, um, yeah sure. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I think one of the distinguishing characteristics in, in ExxonMobil is um, we do invest a lot of money in, in local support. We invest in local support. You, you can buy your local support as a service, and, and we, we, prefer to, uh, we prefer to develop that organically um, in our organization. Uh, the other thing is we, we have a preferred supplier strategy, and that means that the vast majority of our control systems all come from the same vendor. And let me tell you, that makes uh, global support, centralized support, um, much easier than you have a, a variety of systems of support. Um, and that's not just the control system itself, it's also the layer above um, the, the, the level, C, level three systems uh, or the MES layer. Um, but I guess com comparing to, I guess, IT, that, that's a tougher question. I mean, uh, we do the support with an operations technology group and if they're, they're sort of the obvious reasons that um, you have a risk profile that involves not just financial risk, but also safety, health, and environmental concerns. Um, and that takes a special core dedicated group that understands um, how to manage those risks. Um, it's not that we couldn't eventually move the support to the IT organization, we just don't do that yet. And maybe the, the second distinction is in IT, there, there's a little more flexibility, I think, in being able to support remotely, where at the control systems, you really need people on the front lines to manage the hardware. And that's, that's a big difference. Uh, you can't always uh, connect in and solve the problem without being physically there present on the site, uh, which is a, probably a big distinction now between the OT and IT support. Okay, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, DuPont is decentralized. So hopefully it won't surprise you to hear we do not have a central support group of any kind in the process control layer. All support is business centric. And sometimes it's even line of business centric or just at certain plant sites. So depending on the size of the plant, our larger sites do um, have the scale that they can afford um, an in-house support team. So they still have that model. But a lot of the smaller sites, um, they end up having contract support, either a local systems integrator or directly from the vendor. Um, whatever makes sense. Um, particularly in some of the remote regions, we find the local support model actually works really well because that's where the knowledge is that, you know, particularly some systems that are not used as much in the U.S., a, a, a getting support from a U.S.-centric organization just wouldn't have worked. So that, that model has served us pretty well. On the IT side, um, it's a mixed bag. Some things are globally supported by um, an IT organization. For example, um, our laptops, you know, everything in the, uh, in the office space, that's, that's very um, standardized, centralized support. You know, thou shalt have Dell laptops, no other laptops before you, that sort of thing. Um, when you get to the, um, the uh, data historians and MESs, it's a mixed bag. There are some historians that we do have a small support group in the IT organization. Um, but then some of our more recent acquisitions, um, because they came in with different systems, you know, they self-support those systems as well. Um, and there is a support group at the ERP level. Um, but even then, we've got about five different flavors of ERP. So it's very challenging uh, for them to support it. Just a direct result of all the M&A activity that's been going on over the years. OK, thank you. Michael, you have any, you can maybe give us a little perspective on, on your organization, especially as it also is a global organization, too. So when I really think so of 24-7 support, uh, the one who delivers the system is the one who provides service and support for the system. So we, we do not have a specialized expertise than 24-7 on systems. Um, on the IT side, of course, there's a strong like, decoupling between hardware uh, and the application support itself. And um, I would expect at least um, that if you think now about a future world to come with OPAF type structures that uh, since an R tech platform is uh, real time critical for the continuation of your operation for the availability and eventually also so then in the end for the safety I would expect that also to be part of the switch room so that uh, you would not centralize this necessarily into uh, um, some central hosting 
Um, and therefore, I would not expect the, the support models to change that much. It's also that you stay in a package then with the DCN, with the network infrastructure, uh, with an RTAC, which has its hardware instance within the plant so that the plant is in full control of this. And then also then uh, that the system integrator, the main automation contractor, is then also the one who provides 24-7 support for it. Okay. All right, I have a few questions left, but I'm now going to shut my mouth and open this up to questions from the floor. Um, so if, if, again, I have some more, so it won't stop me from asking. So um, if you have a question that you would like to ask any of these panelists in particular, or the panel in general, um, let's see a, see a hand if somebody has a question. There's someone, can't see who it is. The light's a little bright here, I can't see who it is. But it's Dennis. Dennis, oh, okay. Uh -oh, this is be a, hard one. a short question and an easy one, please, Dennis. All right. Uh, Good luck. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, this is real uh, short. Uh, my name is Dennis Brandel, um, and this is to John. Uh, there's not a lot of oil and gas in Perth, as I understand. So, uh, can you give us some of the reasons that you see that the OPATH would add value in the industries that you're serving there? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so yeah, there is a fair bit of oil and gas in, in Perth in Western Australia, as well as mining. Um, and they suffer from a lot of the, the same issues that have um, sort of been brought to the table by all the contributors to um, the Open Process Automation Forum. Um, if I talk about mining in particular, and this is sort of was the other thing about the Open Process Automation Forum that um, took my interest was that, it, um, I mentioned earlier, um, it's covering both that sort of operations management and process control uh, area. Um, and in mining, when you've got a lot of mobile fleet uh, and variability of the material in the ground, um, effective management of mobile equipment um, that can go to the wrong destination with the wrong loads and all those sort of things offers a huge amount of um, value from interoperability. Um, so in, in mining, a lot of the systems aren't in a big monolithic MES, they're actually all modular, but they don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So interoperability allows us to have automated information exchange, which gets us away from a cadence-based human-optimised paradigm to rich, you know, automated information exchange so we can uh, more continually optimise and schedule the whole operation. So that was, that's probably one of the bigger areas. And, and then the other stuff um, around the process crawl and DCS, I think sort of well covered and, and known by the open process, uh, people involved in the project. Does that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I always, I always am amused at the kind of um, similarities in the mining industry and the upstream oil and gas or E and P. You know, it's like reservoir management and all these kind of things are. They have analogs in between the two industries. Um, other questions from the floor? Uh, Jean has one over here. Hi, this is uh, Gene Tung with Merck. And this question is directed to Michael about Namor. Um, to frame the question, um, first, I want to say that OPAF, and I'm going to use Don Bartusiak's words, is a standard of standards. It's not seeking, the forum is not seeking to develop standards unless there's white spaces in the process control hierarchy that you know, are unfulfilled, and, and only then. Open Group is a, um, a standards body and would be utilized in that case. So the question is for Namor. Is, does Namor maintain standards or is it also following a similar philosophy of standard of standards? And if it does maintain standards, you know, is there a strong governance process around that? Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. So first of all, Namur is not um, defining standards, so it's about uh, requirements. And therefore, then um, also ZVI is not doing this, then it's more going to the direction of VDI, so it would be the German one, or then IEC then for the international standards there. Um, and on the other question, actually, that, that was something I asked myself. So with the discussions going on in the open group around, uh, in the end, enforcing uh, the implementation of the standard, so how this should work like then also for, for something like an MTP to have an outside certification that actually something is compliant to the standard 
or if this can be left to self-certification. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Looking, there's one over here. All right. And, yeah. okay, Luis Ran, FBB. So the question is more on the change in roles and responsibilities, uh, especially when switching from a kind of predetermined, pre um, connected, so to speak, uh, control systems into a world in which the components as such are interchangeable, but then the system integrator has the, so to speak, the responsibility to put it together to, to match the requirements of the end user. Um, what's your views, uh, or for the panel to comment, and what are, what are their views on how this changes the uh, roles and the uh, competencies that the system integrator must develop or have available, and how that can be affected in different regions of the world? I mean, I just, my, my knee jerk reaction to that, Louise, is. Um, Rather than having one system with a lot of odometer miles on it, you may have a multiplicity of systems with relatively low odometer miles on them. And you know it takes time to uncover surprises in your software. So I can't help but think that that's a huge risk that we collectively have to mitigate. And maybe the burden lies on the supplier's shoulders to do this. Maybe there's some sort of technology that we need to accelerate you know, the 10-year the time horizon until that bug pops up. Uh, when you have a unique configuration of components in which, you know, when Venus and Mars align, you get the problem. Now, how, how can you fast hit the fast forward button and be able to check uh, all these relationships and dependencies? That's just one of my knee-jerk reactions to it, which I see as maybe the most significant and concerning from, from an operator's perspective. <coughs> Okay, you go I'll, I'll go ahead. It, nobody has to, but if you want to put in two cents there, I'm I'm tempted to ask a supplier to respond to that because I'm sure they're 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 wondering about that too, and it's probably not the most fun part of their life. Um, Julie, I say I'll, I'll, just as a comment, I think you know OPAP is really going to benefit systems integrators because they won't need to know so many different syntaxes of all the different systems that are out there. Um, that's one of the reasons why we don't have interoperability is because everybody calls something something different. Um, so that, I think, will be a real benefit in terms of training and learning. I think it'll also help with uh, SCID in integration, which is something we do a lot of. If we're going to make a new product, we're probably going to buy a SCID that's specially engineered to do exactly what we need it to do. And you know, to get to the point made earlier, if I've got to integrate that and you know, tag by tag bring it into a system, that is incredibly painful. So you know, whether I do it in-house or whether I pay someone else to do it, it's going to be less time and less money to do that under the OPATH world. No mandatory comments. Anything else? OK. All right, we have some questions over here. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> It's Michael Clark. I'm glad to ask a question here. I've been marveling at the singularity of this that just popped into my head, and I thought I'd ask John this, but the more I'm thinking about this, it, it basically goes to the whole panel. Um, John, I've done some consulting work in, in Oz before, and I, I used to hear a lot of complaints about how Australia was really under-supported because of the time difference and the location of Australia being so so distant from a lot of the uh, suppliers that are elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But then, as I've been thinking about that and wanting to get your comment on that, I also thought about some of the, the things that have been uh, said in my history where, you know, Exxon's got operations in Chad and other parts of the world where support is probably not the, the easiest thing to find. I'd like you all to perhaps take a moment and think about how having a standard like this would change the training requirements for people that would be working on these systems from day to day. If, if we could find a unification of standards in that regard, how is that going to help you, John, specifically, and then the other panelists, if they've got remote areas, or even, you know, DuPont, you're talking about such a, dis a disparity of, 
of systems. This is, this is an interesting conundrum we might solve. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, from my perspective, I think there's a, um, a bunch of skills that are going to emerge from, from this architecture and the reality of having these technologies and the optionality that um, will come from an initiative like this. Um, one thing we're doing in, in, in Perth and in Western Australia is we've got a uh, consortium of mining companies together and some oil and gas companies and uh, also a university because we know that there is going to be a fair amount of change and then what does that mean for um, the universities and the, and the, um, the skills and the courses that they have available, you know, computer science purely versus process control and so on and so forth. And um, the reason they're involved in this uh, three-year project that we're standing up is to answer that question uh, and then put in the certifications and the, um, the training required to support the whole uh, ecosystem to move forward. Uh, but in terms of the standardisation, if you imagine that um, there's a lot simpler um, and more standard, uh, less optionality in you know, the configuration code and all these sort of things, then it is going to make um, for a better um, support system in terms of the remote sites and all those sort of things. So um, obviously in mining, we go through a fair bit of uh, my, uh, merger and acquisition as well. So we end up having a whole bunch of different mines under one operator that have completely different systems in there. And then being so remote, getting specialists, you know, convincing them to live in the Pilbara, which is in the middle of nowhere, uh, for, for, for years to support those systems is, is an ongoing challenge. So um, the more standardisation we can get across our various assets, um, the simpler it's going to be um, to find resources to support those assets. Um, but also there's a bit of upskilling depending on the nature of, you know, what that role becomes in the future compared to what it is today. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Anybody else? You know, I, yeah, so I had a, um, my, my, I guess my reaction to that question, Michael, was a, 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 another thought popped into my mind. I mean, I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. I know our upstream organization talks a lot about why we didn't move towards Foundation Field Bus, uh, because some of the remote areas in which we're, we're building facilities, um, you, you can't take a community that maybe has, a, you know, agrarian competencies and suddenly have them working on Foundation Field Bus components overnight. And that was a real problem for them. It was, it was, a, fair, it was a fair argument why, uh, why we needed to stick to 4 to 20. But, but I can't help but think that when you open up a system and you invite competition, it creates innovation. And part of the innovation is going to be thing, doing things faster and, and better. But part of it, I would imagine, would also be how to include technologies that do things that you would expect people to normally do, such as you know, identifying faults, um, self-healing, um, self-diagnostics, and maybe more importantly, the, um, the security you need throughout the system, all the way intrinsically down to the edge device itself, whether that's hardware, root of trust, or what, to be comfortable in having remote support services dial in and diagnose um, at least the things they can diagnose remotely. But th that was just my reaction that the world will change with open systems and competition. And I'm, I'm it, it, you could be right. Maybe there's something there to think about, but I, I have hopes that those, those gaps will be closed because there'll be a market demand for them. Yeah, I guess an, another maybe outcrop of that might be um, the, the flow of data will hopefully get easier. I mean, right now, that's a problem we have with trying to do any sort of manufacturing analytics is getting the data, getting the data out of the you know, different control systems, getting data out of devices that, you know, how do you get that? It's stranded on the, on the devices itself. If once you open up the architecture, once the data is flowing more freely, yeah, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity for innovation to be able to use that data to our competitive advantage. We just, right now, we don't know what we don't know because the data is stranded. Go ahead. So uh, when it comes uh, to, to serviceability of systems, so I would say in a first order approximation, so systems for major suppliers cost about the same. So in a competition, anyone can win in different projects. And also they do about the same. So the biggest differentiation I would really see in the service capabilities and also in the project execution capabilities in a certain region. And those are very different, and this goes by region, Europe, North America, Asia, but it can also go uh, regional or also very locally, depending on which office you are being supported by. And therefore, 
so for example, we're operating certain types of plants uh, around the world and have up to five different systems uh, since we, uh, even though we have only nine of those plants, but all system suppliers are um, represented. And that makes, of course, transferability of solutions quite hard. And that would then also be a benefit of having a more common um, solution designing so that you could make that transferable, even though you are forced uh, by the differentiation to use different vendors in different parts of the world. Other questions from the floor? I've got some, so um, you know, think about it and raise your hand. Don't see any? See any? Okay. Oh, Mark, go ahead. It'll take a second for the mic to run to you, but... Okay, well, he's... Okay. Go ahead. Nemour are working on. So it. it you, okay. So Mark's question is: Can you highlight maybe the major differences between what o, OPAF is working on and and what Nemour is working on? And you, are you specifically asking about MTP or you Nemour in general? I don't know. It, it seemed all different to me. So it, you know, I don't know if there are, is duplication. You've resolved not to duplicate. You know, are you working in different areas? So, so maybe what you're asking is, if we put into perspective, what's the kind of collaboration agreement between Namur and OPAF? Is where what? Well, how do you let, see let that me try evolving? To answer the question the way I think I heard it. Just I think Go ahead. both Michael and I are going to have to answer this question. Uh, but uh, in in its simplest form. Both of these initiatives, MTP and OPA, are seeking interoperability. So components developed, software components developed by separate companies able to exchange meaningful information. That's absolutely necessary in MTP because you have a common DCS sitting on top of all the modular components and different uh, you know, PLCs and control systems in the, in the modular units. Same exact thing OPA is looking for. O OPA is just looking for one, I guess, put it simply, other than things like security and innovation, um, we're also looking for the ability to write your application logic once and be able to run it anywhere. And that commonly is referred to as uh, portability of the application. So right now we're faced with this problem in, in um, dealing with most DCS systems is when the component's obsolete, we have to migrate to a new system, we have to take the application logic and port it to the new system. We don't want to do that anymore. If the equipment in the field didn't change, you want to keep the application logic the same, the program that is, and just run that same exact program on the target system. And there are a lot of ways to solve that problem, uh, but it's a, it's a um, objective is application portability. And that's the one area where there's, there's uh, no overlap, I think, between MTP. But okay. there's probably more. Um, so yeah. you have any yeah. comments, Michael, on that? Yeah, so that's absolutely right. So it's the interoperability. And, and simply, uh, the, the OPAF approach is going one level deeper. So MTP did not touch the actual control application, the PID loops, et cetera, the IO. Uh, it uh, looked at the interchangeability of like batch functions, HMI functions, alarming functions. So therefore it's, it's more in the OPAF going one step deeper. And if you look at Namor in general and also the Namor open architecture, there kind of the difference, if you want to call it like that, uh, would be that there we started more from the approach of how to digitize the existing systems and brownfields, more to build an add-on to it, um, simply also driven out of the fact that we, we, of course, also operate obsolescent systems, but we have replaced already a lot of those, and we are now seeking for solutions how to make those more open um, afterwards. <laughs> and, um, so, and there also uh, the OPAF approach is more fundamental to do that by design then. But the targets are absolutely the same. There, there's not a single point where I would see a contradiction. It's, it's different steps on a timeline. Um, it's different scopes, so where it came from, what it looks at, but I would, I would not see conflicting points. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking for a hand. Not seeing one. Sure, okay. I've got a, I've got a question I really want to ask, so... Um, we talked about, and I asked you guys to kind of prepare thinking about maybe what are the top of mind one or two automation challenges that you see coming for your firm in the next 
in the five, say three to five year horizon? What are the, what are the major challenges that you are thinking about in your organizations regarding automation? And if you have any corresponding initiatives or plans or strategies for addressing those, I'm kind of asking what the, what the tall poles are that this keep you awake at night issues with, with automation that you see as kind of all of you having uh, si some serious responsibility for this area. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have uh, three to mention. Um, so, I mean, the biggest issue in ExxonMobil is, uh, you know, I mentioned that we do have a preferred supplier strategy. I mentioned that that means that the vast majority of our control systems are within the same supplier. I also mentioned that it's wonderful to have that commonality aspect for great advantages and support, but it's also, boy, it's a big, big bang when you have to, when you have an obsolescence issue, you have a lot of equipment to replace at the same time. It's very difficult to stage it over the course of time because you have a deadline in which the obsolescence is going to hit. And if you were to replace a third of your systems, you need to start, you know, 10 years, five years in advance. Um, that, that's the biggest challenge that we have right now. The, the clock is ticking. We have to replace our systems. There is no other choice but to replace the system, something that hopefully OPA will, you know, eliminate in the future. Uh, but that's a huge, tall order. Um, the second one is, in all operating companies like ours, there we always, you know, we mentioned it a couple of times today. We're we're a relatively risk averse group. We we like to migrate and change slowly, and there's a risk aversion that um, and that's one of the things that uh, concerns me. You know, about our, our willingness to manage risk versus take the safe option. And maybe the third one is at least for Exxon Mobil. Um, if we are not successful in replacing our systems with open systems, you know, how are we going to create competitive advantage using, you know, 10 year old equipment? Because you put in a proprietary DCS today, it's going to be there for 30 years, maybe 40 years, or at least in our case, 50 years for some of it. Uh, how do you, how do you generate competitive advantage if you end up locking yourselves in for several more decades? These, these are the things that sort of keep, keep me up at night. So, the core objective of what we're trying to do is make sure that our manufacturing facilities have a choice. At least they'll have a choice when it comes time to make that choice, um, which is you know approaching very soon. Anyway, you guys, welcome. Go ahead. Now I, I see a long journey ahead with migrating systems. Um, you know, across all five of our businesses, um, we run systems past their end of life. Um, Full disclosure, we have a lot of Windows XP out there. All right, I'll take the arrows. We do. <laughs> um, it's because it's not easy to replace. It's not easy to migrate. Um, not only is there the engineering hours of re-engineering of the application, there's the, the outage time, the downtime. But in the business that I'm most familiar with of ours that supports the semiconductor industry, there's the product qualification issue that is just, you know, blows those other issues away. If making a change in your, in, your, in your control system is considered a change in the product, so I've got to notify customers, I have to segregate product, I have to build inventory ahead, they have to test it, let me know it's okay before I can sell it to them. Mm -hmm. That's minimum six months. That's huge. It, getting to a point where we don't have to do that anymore or we only have to do it once, not for each plant, would be fantastic. That's one of the things that excites me about, about OPATH. Interesting comment. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, from my perspective, uh, the one thing that I'm working hard on but sort of, uh, I wouldn't say I worry about it, but it's a lot of work to get through is... Um, attracting all the right talent and interest at all parts of the process to learn about something new and the interruptibility and what it means because it's not off the shelf and available right now. Um, so that when we do get to the point that the technology is available to roll out, um, we have the knowledge and the capability to actually implement these things as soon as possible. Um, so it's about attracting the right people to get involved from all the various areas and, you know, working with um, even getting university and students and graduates into a lot of this, you know, projects and trials and that sort of stuff. So we get some of that, um, the younger generation involved in this work to sort of carry it forward and leverage off what they're sort of learning these days as well. Maybe I should start, but that no automation challenge could keep me up at night. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> 
So, but I don't know whether that's you're bragging about the automation or saying that you're a sound sleeper. But I'll, <laughs> so, I, so the the migrations I would by now see more as a business as usual. So because there's no um, large amount now to be done, especially. So it would be around really tying together very diverse systems. So really the integration part in greenfields, which is increasingly challenging. Uh, it would be around um, satisfying the massive request for data, so also from existing systems uh, to satisfy the upcoming new use cases, pilots, ideas, etc. around augmented reality, which wants to have access to a control system, uh, predictive maintenance, which wants to have machine data, etc. to satisfy all this. And the third part would be around um, a consistent and reusable modeling of different aspects. So that uh, involves the engineering uh, of control systems and plants. So how that can be made in an integrated way in the end, reusable. This is also an issue with migrations in the end that you might not actually know what's completely in the control system if you move on. Uh, that touches things like tech models so that they are consistent across the different systems up to the ERP system, in the engineering system, in the control system, but also then uh, process models so that you can reuse those along the life cycle. So starting from the process design and later that if you want to build a training system and real-time op uh, optimizer that you do not have ever and ever to build those systems again. So this whole, basically you could sum that up as a digital twin. Um, uh, of all the models which surround the plant. Okay, thank you. Now we have time for one more question, probably if there's one out on the floor, which would be better than mine. Actually, I don't think I'm going to ask my last question. Any any more questions? Oh, would you want to? <laughs> we'll never know what it was. Oh, okay. No, I don't. I don't think I will. I think I'll. I'd just like to thank these people for coming and. Uh, sharing with us, especially uh, Michael traveling uh, from Germany and, and representing very well a, a program. While he's very engaged in Namur, it's not, it's not a program that he's most engaged in. So I want to thank Michael for doing that. Certainly thank John for traveling from Perth. That's a, that's a, that's a, if you've ever been to Australia, that's a long trip, and I probably only got halfway there. You know, it's a long way from Sydney to Perth. And uh, Julie's always adding... Uh, a great deal of wisdom to the, to these kind of uh, meetings, and and Steve has been doing so for years. So let's let's thank these people for what they did. Here. <laughs>